All right, now we're gonna look at chapter 25, which is diseases of the digestive system. So when we're looking at the digestive system, this is also known as the gastrointestinal tract and the alimentary canal. Now this starts with the mouth. The mouth then is gonna to connect to the pharynx, the pharynx to the esophagus, esophagus to the stomach, and then the stomach to the small and then large intestine. We also see there's some accessory organs that help in this process of the digestive system. These include your teeth, tongue, salivary glands, liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. Now guys, if you'll note here, this is known as the alimentary canal or tract when we see that it goes from the mouth down to the anus. You were considered what we would see a tube in a tube. Now a quick note here, what's in red, the mouth and the large intestines, they actually have large amounts of normal microbiota, the normal flora um, that's located here. However, um, a lot of these, an example of these are going to be obligate or um, facultative anaerobic bacteria or anaerobes. So we're gonna kind of start here at the top when we're talking about the entrance into the digestive system. These are gonna be bacterial diseases of the mouth. Um, the big thing here is that you're going to have bacteria in your mouth, everybody does. And so the big thing we wanna do is to try to prevent or lower the number of bacteria located there. Um, the big way to do this is to have plaque removal. This includes brushing and flossing your teeth, teeth regularly. Also reduce the sugar in your diet. The more sugar that you consume, the more energy or food source you're giving the bacteria that's located in your mouth. When this does occur and this bacteria does start to um, uh, reproduce and grow in large amounts, this is going to cause dental caries, which um, are cavities on your teeth. These are mostly caused by streptococcus mutans. We also see that it can also progress into gingivitis. This is inflammation of the gums, which then can potentially become periodontal disease where we see the gum start to recede and it starts to mess with the connection of the teeth to the bone. Now, we talked. I, I talked about here that there's bacteria in your mouth no matter what you do, whether you brush and floss regularly or not. And this is because that it is found that there are normally over 700 different species of bacteria in a person's mouth. So there are lots of different things that can be located here. And this is one reason why a human bite can be such a big deal because it potentially cause lots of infections. All right, um, when, you have, when we're talking about with your teeth, with the whole idea of plaque, plaque is that um, kind of slimy residue that ends up on your teeth, which can also become hard when it's up against the gum. And so sometimes you need to go to the dentist in order to get this removed as well. Now we're going to move down into the lower digestive system. Now, when we're looking at the lower digestive system, there's a couple of terms we need to look at. One is infection. Infection is when the pathogen multiplies and it penetrates the gastric mucosa here. We also see intoxication. Intoxication is some pathogens release toxins. These toxins then will affect the GI tract. So it's not actually the penetration of the bacteria itself, it's the toxins that are causing the problems. Now, symptoms a lot of times with um, digestive system diseases are going to be abdominal cramps, diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting. Dysentery is severe diarrhea and this diarrhea will also contain blood and mucus. We also see gastroenteritis which is inflammation of the stomach and the intestinal mucosa, the mucous membrane in those structures. Fluid and electrolyte replacement is super important when we're talking about issues with the digestive system due to the fact that it causes diarrhea and vomiting which means you're going to lose lots of fluid but you're also going to end up losing precious electrolytes like sodium and potassium which also need to be replaced. Individuals who are at higher risk of this being life-threatening are the very young due to dehydration and also the very old. Now, diarrhea and vomiting are symptoms because it is a defense mechanism of your body to dilute and get rid of the pathogen. However, it can lead to that dehydration, which could be life-threatening. So on the bacterial side, we see that there's the staphylococcal food po poisoning. This is normally caused by staph aureus. We also have what we call a shegalosis or shigella species. There are four different types that we'll, talk, that we'll look at. We also see salmonellosis caused by salmonella. This is going to be caused by various serotypes. Typhoid fever, which is also going to be a type of salmonella. This is salmonella typhi, which can be found in the blood and stool. We also have uh, cholera, which is caused by vibrio cholerae. We also have non-cholera -cholera vibrios, which would be vibrio parahemolyticus. And then we also have Escherichia coli, specifically the O157H7. Campylobacter jejuni. Heliobacter pylori, Yersinia intercolidiaca, Clostridium perfringens, Clostridium difficile, 
and Bacillus cirrus. So let's look at staphylococcal food poisoning first. This is most frequently reported food poisoning in the United States. It is caused by an enterotoxin, meaning that it's an exotoxin that's fairly heat stable, meaning that it can survive that heating process, and it does affect the intestinal tract. The toxin causes vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal cramps. The incubation period could be a few hours. The illness is brief, but it is very intense. The treatment, though, is fluid replacement, not antibiotics, just fluid replacement because the body is getting rid of the toxin and the bacteria in the process of the vomiting and the diarrhea. Prevention is careful handling of foods, especially with leftovers. We see there's actually an increased risk when we're looking at um, foods with custards, cream pies, and hams. Now remember, since we're looking at Staphylococcus aureus, this is, remember, beta hemolytic on blood agar. It also has the uh, clustered gram-positive cocci bacteria. It is catalase positive, and it is also coagulase positive. Okay, and so this is several times so far in slides where we've talked about how to identify the staph infection using laboratory procedures. We're going to look at the Shigella group. Um, this is a a facultative anaerobe bacteria. It is also gram negative bacilli. This is why it's called bacillary dysentery. This is mostly seen in young children. Transmission is from person to person through the oral fecal route, meaning that this happens when you don't wash your hands after going to the bathroom, and then ultimately it ends up on something that goes into somebody's mouth, whether it's food or a surface or something like that. It's highly communicable, meaning it's passed very easily, and it is virulent. Um, it, the shiga toxin causes lesions, inflammation, and inflammation of the intestinal lining. This is also known as traveler's diarrhea. It causes a bloody mucus stool, and this is due to the damage of the intestinal lining. Now, one thing to note here is that this particular bacteria is not touched by the stomach acid. It actually can pass through there without any harm, and this is why it can cause such an issue in the intestines. Treatment is rehydration, as well as antibiotics are recommended. So here, guys, if we're using, if we're taking a look here, um, we can use McConkie's auger, and McConkie's auger is going to show us that this is a non-lactose fermenter, um, but it does let us know that this is a gram negative, because remember, this is a, it's going to um, not allow gram positives to grow on the McConkie's auger. This is also a glucose fermenter. It does glu it does ferment glucose, glucose, not lactose. We do see that there are different serotypes that we would want to uh, be able to identify using the epidemiological for epidemiological purposes. Um, the way that they do this is they do this through rectal swabs. They do a rectal swab and then they, they use the different reagents in order to identify the different serotypes. These different serotypes are listed here. Shigella sanii is the most common form of Shigella and it's also very pretty mild. We also have Shigella flexneri. S. dysenteriae, this is the most severe form, and then also and the Shigella, uh, Shigella boide. Boy, yeah. Now moving on to salmonella. Um, this is a water or foodborne infection. It is harbored a lot of times in pet reptiles like in turtles and iguanas as well as in fowl like chickens and other birds. Um, egg and poultry products often are involved in passing on salmonella. Um, it is transmitted by the oral fecal route. It causes extensive diarrhea with fever, abdominal cramps, and nausea. The infection is typically self-limiting, um, therefore it goes underreported. It's not report is often because people tend to start getting better before they get medical treatment. Treatment is again fluid replacement. There's limited antibiotic therapy out there. Uh, prevention of salmonella is proper food preparation and proper hand washing. Again, one reason why we have on when people go to the bathroom and things like that in restaurants, it has the sign that all employees must wash their hands. That also means you should wash your hands too. Everybody should wash their hands after going to the restroom. So if we're looking at salmonella, salmonella is also a non-lactose fermenter. So if we use um, the McConkie's auger, it will grow on it since it's a gram negative bacteria, but it does not ferment lactose. We also see that we can use the 
H-E auger. This shows us that this is an H2S producer, a hydrogen sulfide producer, so it has the black color. We also see that it is a glucose fermenter and it's oxidase negative. Again, we can do um, a serotype type of identification for epidemiological purposes, and this is where it's going to look for the somatic cell wall, which is the O, and the flagellar H antigens. All right, and so this is going to give us two different ways that we can look for this, looking at the cell wall or looking at the flagella that's present. We also see Salmonella typhi. This is cause this causes typhoid fever. This is a gram negative bacillus. It is um, found. There's no animal reservoir for this. It's transmitted person to person through contaminated food and water. The symptoms include high fever lasting several days to weeks. It also causes rose spot skin rashes. Um, the patient will feel tired, confused, and delirious. It can cause intestinal bleeding and wall perforation may occur where we actually see holes in the intestinal wall. And we see that uh, chloroanth Phenicol is used in therapy. Now, one thing with this is it does disseminate into other organs. It does not just stay in the digestive system. Um, a carrier can have this located in their gallbladder and this sheds bacteria and then infects others. They are not actually going to have the symptoms and be sick, but they're a carrier of this. Um, this is actually where the saying of typhoid Mary comes from. Mary was a cook in New York um, in the early 20th century. Um, she was actually the cause of several outbreaks of this uh, typhoid fever and it did lead to three deaths. She was a chronic carrier and did not even realize it but she was a cook which means that it spread with improper hand washing and things like that it spread to other individuals treatment is through antibiotics the mortality rate is high without antibiotic treatment and vaccines are available especially when we look at military personnel instead of just having vaccines available for the general public you can be vaccinated if there's a chance that you are going to come in contact with this or be in countries where uh, that could potentially infect water sources or food sources now with the typhoid fever the organism can actually be isolated from both the stool and also the blood. Um, we do see that there is a two to three week incubation period. Vibro cholerae also causes cholera. The vibro is telling you that it has a comma type shape to it. This is transmitted via contaminated water. It has a it's unipolar flagellated curved gram negative rod. So let's break this down a little bit. Unipolar flagellated means that it's going to have flagella on one of its poles. We also see it's curved in a comma shape and it is a gram negative bacteria. It does produce an exotoxin. Exotoxin, this exotoxin is going to bind to the host epithelial cells. The cells secrete large quantities of chloride into the intestines. Um, in the lumen, large amounts of water and electrolytes start to be secreted. This causes massive diarrhea. This is also known as rice water stool. This is what it looks like, and it can often lead to death. Um, the treatment here is fluid replacement followed by antibiotics. We've got to get the fluid back into the patient. The patient can lose up to three to five gallons a day. Um, this can cause them to go into shock. It can cause them to collapse and then ultimately um, cause death. Um, if you ever were a kid and played the game Oregon Trail, this was one of the things that your characters could end up um, contracting. And if Johnny got cholera, you better rest, but there was a good chance they probably would die in the game because of the fact that it does cause such severe diarrhea. It doesn't tell you that in the game, but that's what it does. Um, we see that it's normally an epidemic after natural disasters because the natural disaster starts to contaminate it will contaminate the water. There's limited outbreaks in the U.S. coastal areas and this is due to advanced sanitation that we have in our country. The non cholerae vibros are going to be what we call Vibrio parahemolyticus. Um, this causes a mild form of gastrointestinal illness. It is a gram negative curved rod. It is harbored in brackish salt water, so it is what we call haliophilic. So it's where the salt water and the fresh water mix, so it does it does have the ability to withstand higher salt concentrations than normal bacteria. Transmission in the it, in the U.S. It's consumption of shellfish in shellfish, especially raw oysters, shrimp 
and crab. We see the symptoms include mild to explosive diarrhea, low-grade fever, cramps, and vomiting. All right, Escherichia coli is a gram-negative rod. It is generally harmless. It actually is found in your large intestine. Um, but it is taxonomically similar to Shigella, so a lot of times it gets named also as the traveler's diarrhea. Um, we see that it can have a pathover virulence factor. This means that it can produce toxins and have fimbrae, which helps them invade the tissue. Um, the enterotoxigenic E. coli, or ETEC, is known as traveler's diarrhea, and the enteroinvasive E. coli, or EIEC, is the Shigella-like dysentery. Enterohemorrhagic E. coli, also known as EHEC, is the um, O157 H7 strand. This one is going to have the O is the somatic antigen and the H is the flagellar antigen. This can cause foodborne outbreaks and this is due to undercooked beef and fecal contaminated vegetables. Um, the virulence has a shigella like toxin and complications can cause hemorrhagic colitis and uh, uremia. This can cause kidney damage and damage to the colon. We see that we can use a certain kind of culture for this. It's called the um, EMB. This is selective for gram-negative bacteria, and it's also differential for the lactose fermenting versus the non-lactose fermenters. E. coli has a classic metallic sheen on here. Um, it is a glucose fermenter, and it is oxidase negative. Also, another test that we could do is the IMVIC reactions, and this gives us ultimately four results when we look at E. coli. The I is for the indole test, and it is positive. It, it is red on top with the indole test. We see that the M is the methyl, methyl red, which is going to be red as well positive for the red. We see it's going to be VP negative. There's no color change. And also the C is the citrate. It's a citrate negative. It stays green and does not turn to blue. These are, again, just some tests that are in the lab that can be done to help us identify E. coli from other gram-negative bacteria. Now, this particular type of media, the EMB, is really important in using for um, fecal coliforms. So when we take the um, sample from the stool sample, they're really good to be used to be able to distinguish different bacteria from the fecal coliforms. Campylobacter jejuni is a tiny curved gram-negative rod. It is transmitted, transmitted via contaminated milk This is and also incorrectly prepared meat and poultry. Symptoms include bloody diarrhea, abdominal pain, and fever. This is a self-limiting type of infection, but we can use treatment. We can seek treatment with antibiotics such as erythromycin. This will actually speed up the recovery. With this group, we can use the campy auger. This is going to be selective. It contains various types of antibiotics. So if you recall, we talked about this auger. It's going to be chocolate auger, but it also is going to have antibiotics in it. These antibiotics can be things like vancomycin, polymyxin B, and trimethoprim. Um, we incubate this at 42 degrees Celsius because this is still a mesophyll type of bacteria. We find that these guys are also oxidase positive, and they are microaerophils. Oxygen is required, but only in low concentrations. Therefore, they really like that structure of the uh, campnophilic type of structure where we put them into the jar and light the candle to get extra oxygen out but it also leaves behind high carbon dioxide that's the type that they that's what they prefer to grow helicobacter pylori can cause gastric ulcer, ulcers disease um, this is a curved gram negative microaerophilic bacteria. It survives in the lining of the stom stomach, so it does prefer a little bit lower pH, a little bit more acidic, not a lot, but a little bit. It produces enzymes to convert urea into ammonia, and it raises the pH. So we see that it actually will embed itself in the mucous membrane, the lining, and then it does start to raise the pH around it to allow it to grow. This penetration of the stomach wall's mucosa potentially causes the ulcer to develop. It is associated with increased risk of developing also gastric cancer. We see that when we culture these specimens, we have to do gastric washing and take a biopsy um, in order to gain access to them. And treatment is normally with antibiotics, which is going to be um, tetracycline and bismuth products as well, like Pepto-Bismol. 
Yersinia intercolidiaca causes colitis. Um, this is a gram-negative rod. It's transmitted via milk and animal products. It is associated with refrigerated leftovers. Um, it adheres to the intestinal epithelium and produces enterotoxins. This causes intense abdominal pain. And a lot of times this gets, because of the intensive abdominal pain, it gets misdiagnosed at first as an appendicitis. Clostridium perfringens causes food poisoning. This is a spore-forming large gram-positive bacillus. It is also an obligate anaerobe, meaning no oxygen. It produces an exotoxin in meat. Um, the consumption of contaminated meat leads to mild gastroenteritis and diarrhea. This is a self-limiting infection and it rarely requires antibiotic treatment. The main thing that needs to be done is rehydration. Clostridium difficile is an antibiotic related colitis. Um, this is a spore forming large gram positive bacillus. It is also an obligate anaerobe. The reservoir is the environment and it is very common. Um, the thing is though that normally your normal microbiota keeps this in check, making sure it doesn't grow out uncontrollably. Um, it does create an exotoxin um, that causes the diarrhea. It is seen mostly in hospitals and nursing homes and it occurs after prolonged use of broad spectrum antibiotics. And this is what happens whenever we kill off and reduce the normal microbiota due to the excessive use of the antibiotics. It allows these guys to get a stronghold, which, which then allows them to take over. Treatment is actually metrazetazole, which targets anaerobes. However, the brand name for this is, the brand name for this is Flagyl. Bacillus cirrus is also a type of food poisoning. This is an aerobic gram-positive spore-forming rod. Um, the reservoir is in the soil and it is actually very common. It often survives the cooking process. Toxins tend to accumulate in vegetable and rice dishes. And the reason it's able to survive the cooking process is the cooking process does kill off the competitors and it allows it to then be able to grow. The symptoms are normally vomiting and or diarrhea. It is self-limiting and there are some diagnostic tests to quantify the number of organisms from the food all right and so what we would do is we would mostly then take a sample of the food and then see if they are present um, culturing it on the media now when they do routine stool cultures there's a number of things that they may use in order to determine what kind of bacteria are present um, they can use what we call a phenolethyl alcohol auger or PEA. This is going to be a selective type of auger. It selects for gram positives and so it's going to allow us to be able to detect if Staph aureus or Bacillus cirrus is present. We can also see that McConkie's auger could be used. It's also selective, however it's going to isolate gram negative bacteria and it's also differential in allowing us to look at non-lactose fermenters such as Shigella and Salmonella. We also see that we can use the, the hectone intric or HE uh, xylose lysine deoxycholate auger or XLD. These are selective and they isolate gram negative bacilli. They're also differential um, in the idea of Shigella and Salmonella due to the um, H2S producers. We also see that we can use the Campylobacter auger. Um, this is the auger that has the uh, blood cells, but it also has antibiotics in it. We can also use GN broth. Um, this is an enrichment type broth, which we can then subculture after 24 hours in order to get um, a good amount of bacteria present. And so these are just some of the ways that we um, can utilize the different types of media in order to differentiate between the different types of bacteria found in uh, a stool sample. Now we want to take a look at the viral um, digestive system disorders. This includes the mumps, um, also known as peritidis, or and it's caused by perimoxovirus. We also have hepatitis A, B, C, and so on, and then also gastroenteritis, which is caused by rotavirus. So when we look at the mumps, the mumps is an RNA virus. It's transmitted in saliva and respiratory secretions, and it replicates in the host respiratory tract. However, it travels in the bloodstream to the salivary glands. The salivary glands are the glands that produce saliva to help you with digestion. Symptoms include the swelling of the uh, parotid glands, which are going to be the glands over here that are going to be part of the salivary gland. These are the glands here. We also see that it can cause fever and the Complication in adult males includes, include orchitis, which, which is inflamed testes. 
Prevention is the MMR vaccine. This is an attenuated virus, meaning it's weakened. We then see hepatitis A. This is also known as infectious hepatitis. This is an RNA virus that lacks an outer envelope. Transmission is from person to person through the fecal oral route or eating mollusks living in contaminated water. Um, the virus is shed in feces, blood, and urine. Um, so again, hand washing is a really a big thing here. The symptoms include vomiting and nausea as well as dark urine and jaundice, and this is due to the liver damage. Okay, the yellow pigment being deposited into the skin and the urine becoming darker. There's no chronic form of hepatitis A. Um, we see that prophylaxis, if you're exposed, is gamma globulin, and then prevention is um, immunization. Hepatitis B is also known as serum hepatitis. This is a DNA virus and it is also enveloped. The transmission is a direct person to person via blood or semen. It can also be transmitted from mother to infant. Um, healthcare personnel are at a very high risk um, in the population due to the fact that they're going to be in coming in contact more often with individuals who are carrying this hepatitis B and their potential blood and uh, in their potential blood. Symptoms are similar to hepatitis A, but they're more severe. It can lead to liver failure or cirrhosis in some cases. We also see some hepatitis B complications include um, it becoming chronic and also a risk of heptocarcinoma, which is a type of liver cancer. Screening is done through a blood test um, and they're gonna be looking for the hepatitis B antigen. Prevention is immunization. The vaccine is genetically engineered. Um, hepatitis B vaccines haven't been around for very long and it is a series of vaccinations normally too. Hepatitis C is an RNA virus. It also has an outer envelope. Transmission is from direct contact with blood and semen. Um, most cases are associated with transfusions. Um, this is known as a silent epidemic because um, before we understood what hepatitis C was, it wasn't tested for in blood. So there's a lot of individuals um, back in the 70s, 80s that potentially could have gotten hepatitis C before it was actually um, identified. 85% of the cases progress to chronic hepatitis. Now this is known as a silent epidemic because it actually kills more people than AIDS in the U.S. and it's normally 20 years before you actually see the symptoms behind it. And so it's progressed it's progressed for 20 years before you actually see the symptoms. 85% of the cases progress to chronic hepatitis. Treatment is interferon plus uh, ribavirin over months of the time, and this is a very costly um, kind of treatment, and it also has some bad side effects. Prevention is to minimize exposure. There's no vaccine for hepatitis C, and so this is why we test blood um, now for it. Also, with hepatitis C, it could be com coming from um, with tattoos. Um, one thing with tattoos, is they of course we want them to use new needles and we know that but sometimes they were using the ink they would use the ink and then whatever was left they would put it back into the large bottle of ink that actually is that ink is going to have blood from that individual that just got the tattoo which was contaminating the entire bottle and so now this is why tattoo places are supposed to also use the disposable cups and get rid of any excess ink that was left behind do not add it back into the main supply we then see the rotavirus this causes gastroenteritis the transmission is through the fecal or route. There is a higher frequency in children. Symptoms include severe diarrhea and dehydration. The diagnostic, diagnostic test is an immunoassay and then treatment is going to be with antiviral therapies. Um, treatment Antiviral therapies are generally inadequate, so again, rehydration is the main course of treatment. All right, now we're gonna look at the ova and parasites that can be found in stool collections. Um, when we look here, ova means egg. Um, we wanna make sure that these stool collections are free of urine. Um, we also see barium free along with other medications such as antacids and laxatives should not be taken. These stool samples, when we're gonna be looking for eggs and parasites, should not be refrigerated. Uh, liquid stools need to be examined as soon as, po as soon as possible and the whole reason for this is they want to look for the motility of the parasite. Um, this is normally ordered in threes, all right, so they'll take it at three different times. Um, normally it's going to be one specimen per day that's taken and there should be a day in between so they should be taking uh, taken every other day um, there are collection kits with preservatives available so this can be done at home and then sent in it doesn't have to be collected necessarily at the hospital 
So why are we kind of talking about this? Well, this is going to lead into our idea of parasites and eggs that are going to come from potentially worm infections. We need to examine this stool a little bit differently than when we examine it for bacteria. We need to do a direct examination. We're going to use um, the scan low and high power on a light microscope. We'll do a saline mount as well as an iodine mount. The saline mount is going to be used to look for motility in liquid stools, and then the iodine mount is going to allow us to stain cellular structures and be able to see what we're dealing with more because of the stain. We also see that we can use the uh, trichome, trichome stain um, for an oil type of uh, magnification. Um, we do see that we can look at the concentration on solid stools where we can actually look for cysts and eggs using iodine as well. So let's take a look at these uh, protists or protozoan type of infections that could take place in the digestive system. Giardias is going to be caused by Giardia lamblia. Cryptosporidiosis, which is caused by Cryptosporidium. We also see amoebiasis, which is going to be caused by Entamoeba histolytica. Now one thing to note about this group is they typically have a fecal oral life cycle which goes between a cyst and a trophozyte type of structure. The cyst is passed in the feces, it is resistant and infective, the cyst will open up which creates the trophocyte. This is going to be the feeding, motile, and reproduction stage of the protozoa. It will then insist itself so that it can be passed through the feces and be able to infect another individual. So this is the life cycle going back and forth between these two forms. So with Giardia lamblia, this is a flagellated protozoan. The, we ingest the cyst form in contaminated food or water. It matures into the trophocyte. It then invades the intestinal lining. This causes symptoms like foul smelling diarrhea, abdominal pain. Um, we do see that people who are at risk are things like hikers and backpackers as well as campers. And this is because streams often contain the cysts that have been deposited there from wild animals. Again, when we look here, the treatment is going to be the flagel. Prevention is water purification. So this is one thing we want to look at. We would look for the motility. You can see that it has the flagella here in this picture. And then we also would use the iodine to be able to look at the stain structures. You can also access this PowerPoint in Canvas, and this will allow you to view this YouTube clip, which shows you the, the motility. All right, now looking at Cryptosporidium, this is a sporozoa protozoa. This is transmitted via contaminated water. It invades the intestinal epithelium, and it causes symptoms like mild gastroenteritis, abdominal pain, and watery diarrhea. Symptoms can be very severe in AIDS patients, and again, prevention is going to be through water purification. So here are some ways that we can look at the uh, cryptosporidium. Um, we can see that there's no movement when we look at the saline here because it is a sporozoa, but we can also stain it in different ways in order to be able to look at its structures. Entamoeba histolytica is going to be a protozoan that causes amoebic dysentery. This one is going to move through a pseudopod where it's going to pull itself forward. The infectious cyst form is ingested via contaminated food or water. It matures into the trophozyte, it invades the intestinal lining, and then it can enter into the bloodstream. This allows it then to move to distant organs like the liver and lungs. Infected individuals pass the cysts in their stools. Again, treatment here is going to be flagel and prevention is water purification. Again, you do have access to this PowerPoint where you can watch the video of how it moves. It shows you the trophocyte form here as well as the cyst form. And then we also see the um, intimidable coli, which is the non-invasive type. All right, so now let's switch gears a little bit and look at some worm infections. Um, this chapter, you're really going to see a lot of types of worm infections that can um, cause issues in the digestive system. Um, this includes your flatworms, which are the group Platyaminthes, as well as your nematodes, which are going to be your round worms. So when we look at the flatworms, we have tapeworms. We have Tinea saginata and Tinea solium here. We also have the hydatid disease. This is caused by... Echinococcus granulosis, and this is a type of tapeworm. And we also have the flukes. Um, we have the liver fluke um, is the main culprit here. Faciola hepatica and Clonorchis sinensis. We then see the nematodes, which are going to be the roundworms. This includes your penworms, Enterobius vermicularis, the hookworms, Nicator americanus, and 
Anita Stolum, Dewana Nally, the Ascarius, which is the Ascarius lumbricordi, lumbricordis, Trichinellosis, which is caused by Trichinella spiralis, Strongyloides, Stercalalis, Trichurus, Trichura, or whipworms. So when we're looking at tapeworm, Tinea saginata is a beef tapeworm, whereas Tinea solium is a pork tapeworm. Tapeworms contain a scolex, which is the head that it helps them attach the intestinal lining. This head contains hooks and suckers, which helps it hold on to that lining. There's also the proglottids. These are the body units of the tapeworm. Um, these are going to contain all of the stuff needed in order to create a new tapeworm. They can break off and be released in the feces. These guys may get caught even though these are what we would consider flatworms, they're very thin and ribbon-like, they can actually get very large um, or very long in the um, intestinal tract, and this may cause intestinal blockage and abdominal pain. So here you can look at a YouTube clip regarding this, but guys, if you look, you can see the scolex, which is the head region, and this is the region up close. It shows you the hooks and um, the suction. We also see the proglottids are the little um, individual pieces of the tapeworm. Again, this shows you the scolex when we're talking about the uh, T. solium. It shows you the hooks as well as the suckers. We see that these can also cause bladder worms, which we call cisterelli, and they can also be encased or sac-like tapeworm larvae, which can then travel to other areas. Um, these can then travel into the brain and insist themselves in the brain or other tissues. Hydatid disease is caused by a small tapeworm. This is known as Echinococcus granulosis. This is infected by contact with animal feces, and, and one of the main examples is through dogs or canines. Um, the hedidid cysts will um, break, there'll be worms in the tissues. The cysts will damage organs such as livers and the liver and lungs. Um, these begin to create fluid filled cysts that have the potential to cause anaphylactic shock. Um, and so it causes your body to have a very severe allergic reaction against the fluid that's the, the, these fluid filled cysts, which you can see located here on this tissue of the liver. We then have the flukes. The flukes are also flatworms, but they're not tapeworms. Um, with these um, liver flukes, they can either come from sheep or also known as the Chinese liver flukes. Um, they do need an um, intermediary host, which is the snail. These are ingested with water plants, um, the watercress. Um, example is the watercress. The larva migrate to the liver and then develop into adults. This results in liver damage and ultimately jaundice. Enterobius vermicularis are the pinworms. These are a nematode, which means they're around worms. We ingest pinworm eggs or we can, by inhaling them or swallowing them. These eggs can hatch in the intestines and then start to mature. The adult females will lay their eggs near the, near the anus, and this causes an issue, especially in young children who are usually infected, which causes them to have an itchy anus. A lot of times we think this is due to them not wiping real well when they're younger, but it could be due to the fact that they have Pinworms. Now, with the hookworms, um, these are also nematodes or roundworms. The larvae penetrate the skin, typically the feet. Um, they have an internal migration that goes from the bloodstream to the lungs to the, to the digestive system. The hooks help them hold fast into the intestinal lining, and then it, this can cause this can lead to anemia, fatigue, and weakness in the patient. You can see the mouth of the hookworm, the teeth in order to, to be able to hold onto the intestinal lining, and then you also see over here um, how it can travel up into the through the feet. Now, Ascarius is a nematode or roundworm as well. Um, we can ingest the eggs of this roundworm. Um, they have an internal migration as well from the intestines to the bloodstream to the lungs, then back to the intestines again. Um, a heavy infestation causes respiratory and intestinal distress. Um, with this group, though, there are male worms and female worms. The female worms are normally larger, whereas the male worms are smaller and have a hooked tail to them. This is how we can tell the difference between the males and the females. Now these infestations can be very large in the intestines causing bloating and causing also food not to be able to pass through. Trichinella spiralis is also a nematode or roundworm. It infects the muscle tissues of pigs. This is passed to humans by improperly cooked pork. Um, it has an internal migration from the intestine and it can invade other tissues. It can insist itself in muscles like the diaphragm and in the eye muscles as well. This causes symptoms like fever, swelling around the eyes due to the cysts being in the muscles, and then gastrointestinal and respiratory pain. 
Strongyloides circularis is also a round worm. These worms penetrate the skin. Their internal migration goes from the blood to the lungs to the intestines. A heavy infest infestation results in intestinal blockage. In the invasion through intestinal wall, especially in immunocompromised individuals. So we see that they actually can break through the intestinal wall in immunocompromised patients. Trichiris trichiura are whipworms. These are also a roundworm. We ingest the eggs from contaminated food or water. The eggs can hatch and then mature in the digestive system. The adults, the adults will then lay eggs and then it will pass through the feces to start the process over again. Now heavy intestinal infestation can cause irritation, inflammation, and potentially obstruction of the bowels um, as well. So this is a quick overview of the digestive diseases. Again, if you have any questions or concerns, please let us know.